So I decided to post that warning again, partly tongue in cheek, but mainly because this is going to be sort of a sequel video to my original Afterthoughts video. That was the predictive rant I did back in June about why I thought Fallout 76 is going to suck. And sadly, almost all of my predictions came true. So for those of you who saw that video and enjoyed it, strap in. You're in for another roller coaster. Now, it did take me a little longer than expected to complete this video because I wanted everything I said to be well informed. I made one mistake in my Afterthoughts video about how a cheering audience member was the same woman as the pre-show host. I corrected that in the comments, but not everyone might have seen that, so I wanted to be a little more careful in this video. You know, to paraphrase Voltaire, perfection should never be the enemy of progress, but I wanted to put a little extra time so the credibility would remain intact. I very rarely do these type of rant videos, but I'm doing it on Fallout 76 here because I'm actually a Bethesda fanboy. When you love a company and their products so much, you get very invested in their success and to be let down with the debacle that is Fallout 76 burns and thus the title of this video. Now for those of you who are enjoying Fallout 76, I feel you. I know exactly who this game appeals to most and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But just keep in mind that these are my honest and informed opinions and the game truly does deserve to be roasted a little bit. Now I said roasted there and not like excoriated or eviscerated or something and the reason for that is because after getting past the innumerable problems that I'll discuss in this video, the game is actually growing on me a little bit. So as I mentioned in my December Overdrive video, I will be posting a follow-up video to this explaining exactly that, why this game is growing on me. So if you do disagree with what I have to say in this video, feel free to leave a comment, but you know, you just might want to temper it knowing that I'm actually going to be joining your side and will be playing the game for the channel into the foreseeable future. And no, that's not pandering for you cynics out there. That's just honesty. The game is a dumpster fire. But hey, people like to watch dumpster fires, right? And I've taken it a step further and turned the dumpster fire into a campfire. And I'll be sitting on a stump roasting marshmallows around it. Doesn't mean it still isn't a dumpster fire. It just means there are ways to turn a glass half empty into a glass half full. The fact that it starts out as a glass half empty sucks, but we'll get into that. Okay, so let's get to why I think this game is such a hot mess. I barely know where to begin, actually. In fact, let's flip it and begin with the exact type of people who like this game, and that'll soften the blows that are surely coming. So if you played Fallout 4 exclusively on survival mode and didn't mess much with the building system, and you intersect with the kind of gamer who enjoys online multiplayer, and you're such a fan of the franchise that you're willing to forgive the myriad technical issues, then this truly is the game you always wanted. It's exactly like the Reddit rumors last year warned. It's a survival MMO with a Fallout skin. Unfortunately, I'm not that type of player. I played Fallout 4 on the very hard setting, but I hate the crunchy minutia of survival mode. You know, worrying about eating, drinking, weapons breaking spontaneously in the middle of combat, disease, encumbrance, etc. I'm surprised they left out sleeping. Somehow you could die from hunger in the game, but not from lack of sleep, which is oddly unrealistic because in real life you die from exhaustion long before you die from hunger. But anyway, who's trying to be realistic here? Oh wait, Bethesda is. Somehow not a single human survived the war unless you were in Vault 76. Like not even other vault dwellers that wandered out of DC into West Virginia just a Vault 76, because Todd Howard and company didn't want to invest in any human NPCs just so that every human would be another player and the game could be called a true online multiplayer in their kind of twisted vision of that. I don't like online-only multiplayer games, so that's another reason why this game rubbed me the wrong way. But this rant isn't about why I personally don't like the game. I was just making the point why this game is very much appealing to a certain subsection of the community. They will fervently defend it, and for all those in that subsection, it's easy to see why. So then, let's jump into why this game is such a problem for the rest of the community. Let's begin with the bugs. Again, where do I begin? I honestly went into this game with an open and optimistic mindset. I said so in various past videos. However, within the first hour, I could already see glitch after glitch happening before my very eyes. In fact, I didn't even make it out of the first room before I realized how much I missed the manual save feature of the previous installments. I spent almost an hour perfectly honing my character's look so it would look like me, because you know I'm not doing a face reveal until the 1 million sub mark. I know you can change your character's look at any time, but I figured I might as well crank that out from the get-go. Well, after spending all that time, it was time for bed. From what I've been told, if you quit to the main menu, it's supposed to save all your progress. So without even leaving the room I woke up in, I quit to the main menu happy with the custom look I had so carefully crafted. Well, the next day after work, when I had time to go back in and leave the vault, I found nothing had been saved. I had to start completely from scratch rebuilding my look. Well, instead of spending an hour, I spent about 10 minutes and he ended up with a pretty annoyed look on his face. 
This time, I made sure to level up before quitting. The funny thing is, is that you know that picture ID you tank when you're done crafting your character look? Well, every time I start the game back up again, the original look I created shows up periodically in that loading screen. So it's like it partially saved, but not enough to lock it in. So it just vacillates back and forth between my old look and my new look whenever I load the game, you know, still the same character somehow. Anyway, this was my first clue I was in for a bumpy ride. So I started playing the game and I'll get into the problems with the logistics and the game mechanics in a moment. But sticking with the bugs here, I didn't make it 20 minutes into my foray into Appalachia before the server disconnected on me. Now I should mention before I continue that I pay for ultra high speed internet from Spectrum, okay? The highest speed that they offer. You know, up until the weird new tax law they passed last year, I was able to write that off of my taxes. But anyway, I usually clock in at download speeds of between 400 and 500 megabytes per second. Well, that's well beyond what should be needed to stay at pace with any online game. And I have a one terabyte Xbox with plenty of room on it. And I don't get disconnected from any of the other games I play or with Netflix or anything like that. Yet with Fallout 76, I was getting disconnected from the server at least once per hour. We have built a platform, 100% dedicated servers that will support this game now and for years to come. As a matter of fact, you'll never even see a server when you play. You think I'm exaggerating? Check it out. And here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and it goes on and on and on. And those were only the times I happened to be recording. Plenty of other times when I wasn't recording. And it wasn't just server disconnections. I would sometimes just lose access to the controller, or sometimes the game just straight up crashed on me. There was no way out except to just unplug my console. Not to mention they straight up shut down the server for maintenance periodically. And since you can't pause the game, if you need to answer the phone or go pee and don't feel like losing your progress, hiding in a corner will cause an inactivity countdown to initiate. And what's this? The worst part is going back in after the forever loading screens and then realizing that some of your recent loot is missing or you're like three locations back from where you left off. And that's just the metagaming bugs. The in-game glitches are equally frustrating or immersion killing at best. Look at some of these monster glitches. The Scorched are the worst. It's pretty ridiculous. Not to mention corpses vanishing before you can loot them or their inventory changing before your very eyes. I didn't manage to record footage of that, but how many times have you guys walked up to a corpse and saw like grenades and molotovs and stuff and all of a sudden it flips on you and there's like, you know, plastic spoons and like, you know, a pipe pistol or something. I'll get into the graphics and stuff in a moment, but guys, there's no excuse for this, okay? Bethesda is supposedly a AAA developer and Fallout is their most beloved franchise alongside Elder Scrolls. For them to release a game in this shape is f***ing madness. And by the way, I have about 70 hours invested in the game at this point, so it's fair to say I'm making an informed opinion in this video based on both research and personal experience. So why is this happening anyway? Well, personally, I feel it all boils down to greed. Instead of truly investing in development for this much type installment, they looked cutting every corner they could find. I won't get into bag gate or the microtransactions or anything like that in this video. I'll stick with the basics, okay? Because there's so much to cover with just the basics. First of all, instead of licensing a new engine for the game, they decided to recycle their nearly obsolete creation engine. They simply didn't want to spend the money on something like the Unreal Engine. So instead, they went back to a, well, an engine that is literally decades old. Sure, you can slap enough duct tape on something and make it look shiny and new, but underneath all that duct tape are rusty pipes, people. And by doing this, not only would they save on licensing costs, but it would allow them to simply cut and paste old assets from Fallout 4 with almost no effort. In fact, some of the stuff isn't even reskinned. It's just, it's, it's literally recycled material. What's so weird is that even on other games in their repertoire, you know, like Zenimax's repertoire, they use more modernized engines. You know, Dishonored, for example, uses the Void engine. Rage 2 uses the Apex engine. And Doom and Wolfenstein use the ID Tech engine. None of them are that great, but all of them are better than the old fart of the creation engine, okay? And there are so many good engines out there. You know, Ubisoft uses Dunia, Anvil, CryEngine, Rockstar uses the Rage engine. I've been playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Red Dead Redemption, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that I haven't run into a single glitch. Not a single solitary glitch, okay? 
I mean, maybe some other people might have run into one once in a while, but if I can go for as long as I have in those two games, you know, for my uh, Saturday Night Special series and not run into any glitches, yet I can plan on running into a glitch multiple times per hour that I'm playing Fallout 76, there is something truly wrong here. And with the engines that Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Red Dead Redemption use, I mean, the worlds look beyond gorgeous. I mean, they're just truly stunning. What do we get with Fallout 76? We get blurry textures, out of focus draw distances that give me a f***ing headache. I basically have to look down a lot of the time so my eyes won't wig out on me, you know? You have these pathetic water graphics. I mean, look at this. Now compare that to Assassin's Creed Odyssey, okay? My God, they're not even in the same league, you know? It's like kindergarten versus college. And what was the price difference between Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Fallout 76? None. Same price. Although because of some of the backlash, 76 has dropped in price, which aggravates me because I paid almost $70 after taxes. Thank God I didn't buy the $200 edition. But back to the bugs. Yes, Bethesda continues to put out patch after patch. But how is that even an excuse, you know? Imagine turning in a term paper at school and telling the teacher that it's a work in progress and you'll continue to turn in updates and corrections as the days and weeks go by. The teacher would laugh and give you an F. So let's take a quick look at the grades that Fallout 76 has gotten because I don't think I've ever seen anything like this, okay? Game Informer, which is GameStop's own internal magazine, gave it a 6 out of 10. And they even have a vested interest in selling games, okay? Metacritic and IGN gave it a 5 out of 10. And it continues to get worse. GameSpot, 4 out of 10. And Metro, 3 out of 10. Look, even their highest score, PC Gamer, gave it a 6 out of 10. Guys, that's a score of 60%. In school, 60% is a failing grade. For a AAA game, I've never seen anything like that, truly. Even No Man's Sky and Battlefront 2 scored better than Fallout 76, and those games were heralded as disasters. This is really a blow to such a beloved franchise, and again, it all comes down to greed. Let's take a look at it from a psychological point of view. Most games give you a physical collectible or a free DLC item that you pre-order. With Assassin's Creed Origins, for example, I got both. I got this cool little collectible keychain. Oh yeah, with Odyssey too. That's right, I got this little Spartan helmet keychain. But in Origins, I got this cool like Medjai little figure keychain. And I got two DLC packs that came with the pre-order. What did Bethesda do? <laughs> I didn't even do the pre-order because I was like, that. They put their pre-order fans to work, like unpaid interns. No, interns that had to pay to play. Instead of employing an army of beta testers to help fix their game before launch, they farmed out the work to fans. How could they possibly think this was a good idea? You know what I mean? First impressions are everything. I, I read on the internet that our games have had a few bugs. The Break It Early test application. Todd can make all the jokes he wants about how his games are notoriously buggy, come up with a campy abbreviation for the word beta, and then ask the community to note their flaws in order to save on labor costs. I've never seen such gaslighting before. Now in the past, they've allowed unpaid modders to fix their games on the fly, but they can't save them this time because of the online nature of the game and because of Bethesda's tight controls on the servers. The bugs in the past games were somewhat cute and meme-worthy. I even made some funny videos about them, like my April Fool's Glitch Palooza video. Out here, you gotta take things one day at a time. But it's beyond that point now. It's no longer funny. With the inability to save on demand and then reload at that exact point you left off now turns the bugs into rage quitting memes. And you know what's so ironic? You didn't used to be able to manually save in Assassin's Creed games, but now the tables have completely turned. You can now quick save as well as save on demand in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and you can't in Fallout 76. Same with Red Dead Redemption 2, but not in Fallout 76. We're in the upside down, people. These other game companies are listening to their fans 
and Bethesda is doing the exact opposite. These other companies are progressing while Bethesda is regressing. And to the people who are saying that Bethesda will fix all the bugs in the game, don't worry about it. We have to look no further than Fallout 4, where bugs and glitches, some even quest breaking, have still not been fixed all these years later. I've made at least two videos on how to overcome certain game breaking bugs and to this very day I still get comments on those videos of players thanking me for their help because Bethesda couldn't be troubled to fix it themselves. And what's maddening is that Bethesda will jump right on the exploits and fix those immediately, you know? Can't have players finding sneaky ways of making the game extra fun for themselves. You know, there have been several nerfs already that were included in some of the recent patches. Some of the mega patches. I'll get into that in a moment. But you know, some of the fundamental stability problems with the game are still present. I'm still experiencing them, like, as I'm making this video. And I imagine they'll be present for a long time, as it has to do with the cheap use of their recycled old game engine. As the saying goes, penny wise, pound foolish. But most of the fans have had enough and are pounding Bethesda back this time. You know, there's been word of class action lawsuits and the like. Bag gate. I won't get into all that mess. I'll leave the game news to other reviewers. I just wanted to make a few more points about the graphics before I move on to the next category. At E3, Todd Howard said this. It allows us to have 16 times the detail. So 16 times the detail, huh? I want to show you what I've seen. Take a look at this. Is this 16 times the detail? Looks blurry as f to me. And look at this. I went to the top of a really tall tower to see how beautiful the distant scenery looked. You can go to these tall towers once in a while and click the activate button to update your map. So what does it do? Well, all it does is list a few new locations that have updated on your map, you know, in the top left corner. Then I look out to the horizon and I see something that looks like an impressionist painting. Now compare that to the exact same game mechanic in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. You can climb to the top of these tall landmarks to update your map and survey the surroundings. This is what I was talking about earlier. The comparison is not even in the same ballpark. Kindergarten versus college. And by the way, if anyone gets upset that I'm comparing Bethesda to Ubisoft, I just want you to remember that Bethesda is not the underdog. They are the bigger dog. ZeniMax has a bigger annual budget as well as revenue, and yet somehow Ubisoft is able to crank out super high quality games every year. It took Bethesda three years to release this piece of sh Something is very wrong with this picture. Just take a quick look at some of the things I happened upon in Fallout 76. Besides all the terrible draw distances, you have blurry ass textures. Looks like something from Minecraft until it actually comes into focus. You have floating textures. Floating rocks. Floating branches. Parts of the ground that aren't clipped properly. And this time it features all new rendering, lighting, and landscape technology. And remember how they bragged about those amazing god rays? Apparently they're so godly that they defy physics. You have lazy bounding boxes. In real life, you should be able to walk right through there. You have enemies that are aiming their guns in the air and somehow still hitting you. Or in some cases, they don't even aim. What? Some of the enemies can't even be bothered to animate. It's as if the monsters in this game are like, Screw this dude, just put us out of our misery. This dead suicider is still holding his mini nuke and beeping. <laughs> Hilarious. This is what I said in my original Afterthoughts video about how they're showing us what it's going to look like is the ideal situation. How is it that Fallout 4, which came out three years ago, looks better than Fallout 76? Isn't technology supposed to improve with time? Guess Moore's Law applies to all other game studios except Bethesda. Plus, you can still get stuck in so many places. I used to just sigh when I got stuck in rocks back playing Skyrim. I got used to quick saving often because it was a Bethesda game. Now I have to exit the server and pray my progress is checkpointed when this happens. 
And when you legit die, sometimes you can't even respawn back to where you started. My character is dead in this clip and it's asking me to choose a respawn point, but no place will let me choose it. And it's not even showing my camp, which should be very near to this location. So I just have to quit the game and reload. To add insult to injury, it flashed a level 5, you can PvP now warning as I reloaded back in and it scared me half to death because I was like at level 30. And at that point I was thinking, it did not just erase 25 levels of progress on me, did it? Giving people heart attacks over here, Bethesda. I'm dying. You hear that, Elizabeth? I'm coming to join you, honey. I understand that some, though not all, of these bugs will be fixed over time. Fingers crossed on that, by the way. Sometimes it doesn't just work. What I don't understand is why Bethesda games are always released as a starting point. How can they think that's a smart business decision that'll save them money? It'd be like Star Wars releasing a movie and saying, come back in a couple of months and we'll have the updated special effects. Not only would it be a box office flop, but you'd lose a lot of goodwill you've generated through past installments. Your fan base is like a form of capital that can either be grown or blown. And right now, you're blown it, Bethesda. Now, I consider myself an optimistic guy, so I do think you can recover from this, but it's going to take a lot of effort and strides and you need to listen to your fans. And if you're in the upper management seeing this, money needs to be invested in quality assurance, okay? QA is like your kryptonite. If you drag that kryptonite into Starfield and Elder Scrolls 6, you won't recover. It'll be the end of an era. Alright, that's enough on the technical bugs. I can go on and on about the technical bugs, but let's talk a little bit about game design because so many poor game design choices were made, it makes me wonder if Bethesda actually plays its own games. And by the way, if you are a Bethesda employee watching this, you need to play other games too, you know, your competition. You need to see how they're doing things better. If you restrict your view to your own little bubble, you'll never understand the ever-changing landscape of the gamer sphere. So the first thing that comes to mind is the heavy survival element. I like to think of it maybe... It's more softcore survival. I don't mind a little bit of survival in a game, but this level of survival is supposed to mimic realism because I don't think real life is this grindy and real life is pretty damn grindy. But real talk here, okay? Like for example, guns don't break just by shooting them, okay? Maybe if you don't clean them and let them sit out in the rain and rust for months. But in this game, my guns are breaking after like a few hundred shots. That is so beyond unrealistic. And just to have it vanish from your hands in the middle of like a mole rat swarm is just agony. And speaking of unrealistic, having to eat that much food and drink that much water between sunup and sundown would rupture a person's stomach or give them like water hypoxia. But screw realism, somehow they needed to make the game extra grindy to satisfy some players' twisted notion of realism. Also, let me add this little factoid here because it's the school zone and all. There is no way adhesive needs to be so rare in a post-apocalyptic world, okay? The character could make adhesive out of every corpse he or she finds. Glue, in real life, is made from the skin, tendons, ligaments, and bones of animals. Or basically any living living thing with collagen and keratin. That's where the expression of old horses being sent to the glue factory comes from. So the character could take all those bones and hides he collects, for example, grind them down, add like dirty water, and through hydrolysis, you have adhesive. You basically boil it down at a cooking station. It doesn't have to come from duct tape. Duct tape is basically fabric strips with adhesive on one side. You'd get more plastic and cloth components from duct tape than actual adhesive. The science behind the game just annoys me sometimes because because they're making things so grindy when they don't need to be. Why? Well, it could be the developer's lack of knowledge or research, but it probably has to do with another component, and that's game hours. I don't mean to sound cynical, and, and it, it may, but sometimes games are ranked among their competition by how many game hours you can get out of a game. It's a metric that allows upper manage to yell down the hall to the developers and say, you know, make this game soak up more game hours to boost our metric. And the game developers yell back, can you boost funding so we can create more content? No? Okay, well, I guess we'll just make it more grindy then. Which leads to another point about fast traveling. They discourage fast traveling in Fallout 76 by making it cost caps. Caps end up being an extremely rare commodity in this game that you need for many things, like purchasing ammo, ballistic fiber, cool building plans. Since they limit what you can actually sell back to vendors, caps are hoarded like gold. And to make fast traveling costs gold encourages players to say, you know, f*** it, I'll just walk. And thus, more game hours. Again, I know that sounds a bit cynical, but some of you know I'm right about that. 
Now, I know in Fallout 4, fast travel wasn't available at all in survival mode. That's one of the primary reasons I played on the very hard setting, but never survival. Survival mode was specifically for the people who have the time to kill in a game being grindy. Unfortunately, there's no way to turn that off in Fallout 76. It's forced on you, and for the more casual gamer, it's ever so discouraging. And the thing that really bugs me is the encumbrance system. I never really got encumbered in Fallout 4 because I didn't need to carry a lot of junk and too many aid items, and I didn't need to carry junk or large amount of aid items because my weapon's armor weren't breaking and I didn't need to worry about eating or drinking or disease. So in Fallout 76, all those survival elements require you to carry junk and excess aid. And you need to take all those extra guns and armor back to your workshop so you can break them down for mods and scrap. You can't upgrade anything unless you do that endless cycle for each gun and armor type. You got this tiny little stash box, but it fills up so quickly because you also need materials for building your camp. And you also sometimes want to save up some cool gear that you can't use yet because of the level requirements. I'll get to the level requirements in a second. But just the grind of finding all the right materials that you need just to upgrade or even repair a cool weapon is a total time sink. In fact, I found myself exploring new areas not because I wanted to explore them, but just because I couldn't update a quest. For example, I couldn't repair Abby's uplinker thing because I was missing two adhesive and two of some other dumb component. Now some people might say, but you can fast travel to your camp for free, but then it costs caps to fast travel back to where you were. And if you want to keep your camp close at all times, moving it also costs caps. To be honest, I found a cool way to just stay encumbered all the time and still move at a relatively normal speed. It's a clever combination of perks, which I'll show in an upcoming video. It's got nothing to do with the armor glitches or anything, which I think they patched anyway. So I just have my stash box filled to the max. I'm carrying about 700 pounds more on my character. Now, before anyone complains that I'm the kind of player that contributes to server lag, I just want to address that real quick because that's something I've been thinking long and hard about and it makes no sense. In fact, it should be the opposite, okay? As I remove junk from the world, it should ease server lag, okay? Let, let me explain. The computational element that puts the most strain on a server CPU is graphical representation, meaning turning a bit of code into something that is visually rendered on your screen. Code is cheap. Fully attenuated graphics and animation are not. So when my character picks up a food item off a shelf or a clipboard off a desk and it removes it from the world, the GPU should be relieved. It no longer has to render that object as I move around the area. And what should happen is that it's turned into a simple integer. You know, like clipboard equals 5 now instead of 4. And it's not like the game engine has to graphically render 5 clipboards in my inventory anymore. They're permanently gone from the game world. It's just a snippet of code now. And it's not even a snippet, we're talking bytes. Like, not even megabytes, just bytes. If you were right now to open a text document and type out all the gear your character is holding in a list and then save the file, it would amount to a few kilobytes at most. And the game engine should also be just trading integers and percentages when you do things like eat an aid item that boosts strength and heals some HP. It's just trading numbers. There's no reason for any strain on the server. Now in Fallout 4, that was a different story because you could literally drop thousands of bottles on the ground and crash the game. But that's because the moment they went from being a representative integer in your inventory to being needed to be graphically rendered, the strain hits the GPU big time. They solved that in Fallout 76 by trading containers. Your character is container 1, and that little brown baggie you drop is container 2. You see what I'm saying? And if you need further proof, there are even some perk cards that reduce the weight of carried objects. In fact, there are a lot of them now in Fallout 76. Oh yeah, Paul, that's right. Mm-hmm, think about that. Now there is one way that it could still be putting a strain on the server, and that's if the game engine is so old and so bad, and the coders were so lazy that they didn't adjust the game mechanics between the two versions of Fallout, where the game is still trying to pre-render all those carried objects. Then yeah, maybe. But for one, that shouldn't be our fault as consumers, and two, that would represent a colossal failure in coding management for the game. That would be one more nail in the coffin for the creation engine, and maybe even the currently employed dev team. Stranger to blue water 
Okay, moving on to some more points about the census game design. What are the numbers they added to the enemy's health bar? I assume they're supposed to be levels because they seem completely arbitrary to me. It doesn't help me in the slightest. At level 22, for example, I was able to take out a 50th level mongrel in a few shots, whereas I rounded the next hill and ran into a 20th level deathclaw and my shots were barely moving its health bar. That makes no f***ing sense. See, Assassin's Creed Odyssey got it right. The enemies that spawn are always your level plus or minus five. That way you can decide if you want to engage with them or not. If they're five levels lower, you can relax and have fun trying some creative kill tactics. If they're five levels higher, a skull will appear above their heads, letting you know that it'll be next to impossible to kill them. You can still try, but it's going to be a long and stressful experience. In Fallout 76, you have absolutely no idea where you stand according to that level number until you see how much damage your first shot does. And by that time, sometimes it's too late because they'll start to dart in you like a big screen TV on Black Friday. Or maybe not. I'm level 30 now and I can take out a level 60 Scorch Leader in a few shots, yet a level 18 Glowing one might be a f***ing damage sponge. I pretty much ignore the numbers now because it's just bad game design. They could have found a much more logical system for calculating the level difference between you and the monster. But alas, they didn't. The numbers weren't there in Fallout 4, so this is something new they made up, and again, they just didn't put themselves in the player's shoes. The new perk card system is kind of nifty at first, okay? You get to see something that looks like trading cards with their own little graphics and animations. You get perk card packs with gum and a joke. You know, the idea is cute. But the actual mechanics of it ended up being not very carefully thought out in the slightest. First of all, they introduced a huge element of chance to the perk system, which makes it incredibly hard to plan out your character. If you guys saw my videos on creating the epic stealth character in Fallout 4, you know I carefully planned out my character from level 1 to 50 because I could visually see what I needed to work towards and what sacrifices I needed to make. With this new system, not only can't you see what's up ahead, but you don't even know if you'll luck out with the cards that you want. What ends up happening is that you take perk cards just to counter the grinding annoyances in the game, like reducing disease or reducing carry weight. They do allow you to swap out cards between levels, which is a weird compromise to make because it flies in the face of the realism element they were stressing with the survival theme. I mean, you just don't need to equip your lockpick or hacker cards, for example, until the moment you need to unlock or hack something. On the other hand, it took me 15 levels before I lucked out with a lockpicking card, and another 10 levels before I lucked out with an expert lockpicking card, which is not even the same kind of card as the lockpicking card. Yeah, they made it way more complicated than it needed to be by allowing you to merge repeated cards, but not cards that sound similar. The whole thing reminds me of a really complex card game like Bridge or Gin Rummy, where you need to learn the rules of the game before you can even play. And with the new perk card system, you can't go back and fix something. You pick and it's permanent. No reloading an old save. Now don't feel bad if those of you watching wasted some perks figuring out how the system works at first, I wish you could go back and change things. That's what happened to me, and I even consider myself a very smart and savvy player. It's just a mess. It's a mess with a cutesy veneer. And the funniest part is that you actually have to go and find a safe place to hide while you level up, because there's no pausing in the game. And you really do need to put some time and thought into it if you want to get it right. So it's like I find myself waiting to level up until I can hide in some dark bunker where nobody's gonna bother me, you know what I'm saying? It's just stupid. I'm gonna be making some videos guiding you through some of the perk choices because I've figured out a lot that I think are gonna help you guys with. But if you're just starting the game, my advice is just to decide which parts of the game annoy you most and focus your cards on those for the first few levels, you know? Like, does being encumbered really annoy you, or does getting diseased really annoy you, or does getting hungry or thirsty all the time annoy you? Does your weapons and armor breaking too often annoy you? You get the idea. I didn't get to start focusing on being a stealthy sniper, which just happens to be my preferred game style, until he was well into his teen levels. Next, what is up with the item level requirements? I do not understand this. It makes no sense from a logical standpoint. Like, I don't know what they were trying to accomplish by introducing that mechanic. It certainly doesn't represent real life realism. So it might have something to do with PVP, right? You don't want a level five player attacking another level five player with a missile launcher. That would be unfair. But the problem with that is that you're not brought into a server according to your level. If you're level five, you might encounter another player who's level 50. So that logic flies out the window. So it must have something to do with the damage it can do comparatively with another weapon of lower or higher level. Not really. What makes a gun do more damage or have further range are the mods you put on it. I'm level 35 now and my favorite sniper rifle is one I found at level 14 that only required me to be level 10. I've just upgraded it with the mods as I find them and level up my gunsmith perk. 
So just like the monster levels, the gun levels seem completely arbitrary to me. Again, this will sound cynical, but it just seems like a way to get more game hours out of me. I found a piece of regenerating armor at level 7 that I couldn't use until level 35. So now that I'm level 35, my health regenerates super duper slowly over time when I'm not in combat. Not something that would have been game breaking by letting me wear it at level 7. It just means now I don't have to pick up every can of cram and dog food I find, you know? If I'm severely injured, I use stim packs as usual. It's just a silly arbitrary mechanic intended to increase their game hours metric. You know what, I won't even get into how silly and mangled the building system is. I'm going to save that for another video. I was also going to touch on PvP, but this has started to become a long video. I'll just say this to those who are hoping this would be a battle royale type game. It's not. There's no random PvP. You shoot a player who doesn't want to fight and he just ignores you. You unload all your valuable ammo into him and one stim pack makes it all a waste. I was never particularly interested in PvP, so this doesn't bother me too much, but it's just another example of how this should have been a solo game for the solo players, a team game for friends, and a PvP game for those who like that. You know, separated by an opt-in mechanic when you first log into the server. Instead, it's just a mishmash of all three that doesn't really satisfy anyone. I feel like the players who want to fight other players will just gravitate to games better suited for that style and then it's like why did they bother in the first place when they could have just made it a solo experience that most everyone else wanted a few more points about the senseless game design and then i'll move on to my final point at e3 todd howard said this it is four times the size of fallout 4. What a big boast, right? I had a feeling that statement alone swayed a lot of pre-orders. The problem with that humble brag is that it's misleading at best. The map itself may be four times the size of Fallout 4, but you'll quickly notice it's a lot of empty terrain, which I'm sure was at least partly populated by a cheap auto-generator. I mean, what game designers would do this on purpose? I don't think so. So while the map itself may be four times the size, I would be very surprised if there are actually four times the locations. Fallout 4 was very urban dense, and even its outer regions had a lot of interesting locations. I wouldn't be surprised if before too long someone does a list comparison of how many actual locations there are between the two games. I mean meaty locations, you know, Fallout 76 has a bad habit of calling a fairly empty one-room open shack as a location on the map. Anyway, I just found myself getting really bored of all the empty woodlands and flat slabs of rock that act as complete barriers in of themselves, you know? Just walking around those things, trying to get up and down, what the hell? And for those who don't want to waste caps fast traveling, this is one more way to rack up game hours. Which leads to my next point, and it seems like a lot of the quests revolve traveling to a ton of disparate locations just for the sake of traveling. This became very obvious to me during one of my early quests where I had to travel across the entire map to use a tinkering bench at a random ski lodge because apparently no other workbench in West Virginia would do. Or the DMV quest where you have to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth again. I realized there was an inside joke there about the nature of bureaucracy, but it just, it feels like it falls on deaf ears because almost every quest is like that. Now, all games have their fetch quests, of course, and there are even some in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, but it just feels different because in ACO, you're often rewarded with a beautiful cutscene to break up any hint and monotony, and there are often some very cool rewards, sometimes legendary items. Compare that to Fallout 76, where you get the same amount of XP for completing a long, lengthy quest as you do for taking out a single high-level enemy. The whole thing feels very deflating. And what's the deal with all those recycled assets? I mean, come on. There are a few cool new monsters, and I will touch on that in my positive follow-up review, so credit where credit is due. But other than a few new monsters, almost everything feels like it was recycled from past Fallout and even Elder Scrolls games. I mean, Scorch Beasts just feel like reskinned dragons from Skyrim, except they're 100 times smarter and harder to kill. And they breathe radiation, which is technically doing double damage to you, and can penetrate walls and there's no dodging it. And screw melee-based characters if they get noticed by a Scorch Beast. One of the main reasons why I decided not to go the melee ninja route. But my main point is that it just feels lazy. And they couldn't be troubled to create any new animations, even for the smallest things like opening doors, lock picking, unarmed combat combos. I mean, compare unarmed combat in Fallout 76 to Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Again, no comparison. And they had the time to spare because they took out any dialogue options or dialogue cutscenes like they had in Fallout 4. 
just so many recycled assets. And what's such a joke is that they're trying to sell some of those recycled assets in the Atom Store. Now, I won't go too much into the Atom Store because they just barely colored inside the lines by allowing you to accumulate atoms through gameplay. So it's just enough of an excuse to stem the tides of any microtransaction revolts. But we all know what the Atom Store is all about. It's a cash grab. I had no problem paying $10 for Nuka World, which was actually a very rich DLC with what I would argue at least a very cool storyline, tons of new building materials, and ways to alter the course of your gameplay. But since 100 atoms is roughly equivalent to a dollar in Fallout 76, look at what they're selling for $10 in the Atom Store. A whole Nuka World DLC versus this? What the f Bethesda? The final point I'd like to make is about the boredom and loneliness I'm already feeling in Fallout 76. Oh wait, Paul, didn't you mention you're going to be making a video about how the game is growing on you? Indeed, I am. But here's the thing. I'm learning to enjoy the game despite itself. I'm finding ways to mold and adapt my game style and expectations to meet the conditions and economy of the game. The game is playing me, not the other way around. It shouldn't be that way. The game developers should be making games we all enjoy out of the gate, not games we have to learn to love. You know what I mean? I said this in my Afterthoughts video back in June. In fact, if you go back and watch that video, it's kind of crazy how many predictions I got right. But this one prediction is one I thought I could overcome because I enjoy solo gaming so much. Here's the problem with Fallout 76. With the removal of human NPCs, and most importantly NPC companions, there's a startling loneliness that develops. I just don't feel that way in other games because of a combination of elaborate cutscenes and the human interaction. What's funny is, is that it didn't even have to be human interaction if they wanted to hold the line that all humans would be other live players. They could have had ghouls like Hancock or super mutants like Strong or Virgil. Hell, even f dog meat following around would have been better than nothing. And before anyone says that the game is meant to be played with friends, let me assure you that I have plenty of friends. But here's the reality of it. Most of my real life friends don't game that much, to be honest. I'm sort of the black sheep among my real life friends. And the ones who do have a different platform than me, or have different work hours and free hours than me, or just don't like Fallout games. They'd rather play God of War or even Fortnite. Most of the free time I have to do gaming is late at night on the West Coast. Most of my local friends, and pretty much all of my East Coast friends aren't awake that late. Most of them have PS4s anyway while I play on an Xbox, and most of them don't even like Fallout 76. And I imagine I'm not alone. Probably a lot of you are in similar situations. First, of course you can play this solo, all right? If you happen to have a tight-knit group of friends who all love Fallout 76 and are all in the same time zone and you all have mic headsets and you all have a set schedule to game together, then this game is ideal for you. But if that's what Bethesda was banking on, my god, what a small subset of players they intended to appease. So yes, you can play Fallout 76 alone, but you'll need to prepare for it being a fairly barren experience if you haven't experienced that already. Oh, and by the way, have you noticed that all the other characters in Fallout have been named like Lone Wanderer, The Chosen One, The Soul Survivor? etc. Now, you're just a grain of sand on the beach, you know? You don't feel that special. And let's be honest, who wants to experience the game through reading terminals and listening to recordings anyway? Video games are supposed to be like interactive movies. At their core, that's what they are. Now imagine going into a movie and being forced to read the plot on a terminal, or stand there and listen to a tape. Most people will be walking out of the movie theater. They completely overestimated the amount of players who actually take the time to read terminal entries. You know, not everyone's Oxhorn. I actually used to do that in Fallout 4 because it wasn't an abuse mechanic. I don't do that in Fallout 76. Most of the time, I'm just quickly clicking through them to see which entries update the quest. And that's sad. It's just missing the charm. It feels like a slog. There's no fanfare or great rewards for quests, no feeling of specialness for achievement other than, you know, there's one more thing I can check off my list. At E3, Todd Howard said, we always start with the world. We always start with the world, huh? Perhaps in past games, but I have to question why they decided to place this game in West Virginia. Was it simply so they could have vast stretches of nothingness and call the map four times the size of Fallout? It just doesn't seem like there's a hook for having it take place there. With the lack of human NPCs, it seems like the fallback appeal would have been the world itself. The world of a game can be like a character of sorts, but there's just nothing I've found that necessitates that it takes place there. If they wanted to go the no human NPC route, then they could have picked a location that had more character. You know, like New York City or San Francisco or New Orleans. New Orleans would have had so much character and lore. No offense to West Virginia, of course, but it's not exactly a hefty tourist destination, you know? 
Sure, it has a few interesting cryptid legends, but it just feels like a lifeless landscape. It's just acres and acres of boring. Okay, so here's my takeaway. They could have just called it Fallout Online. That's what they did with Elder Scrolls Online, and apparently a lot of people worldwide play that game. But they went awry with Fallout 76 because they tried to clickbait the fans. They should have just trusted that an equal number of people who love Elder Scrolls Online would have loved Fallout Online. They shouldn't have hyped it as a new installment. Honestly, they would have gotten a lot less hate if they hadn't even hyped it at all. If Fallout 76 had just appeared out of nowhere, or they said at E3, you know, here's a snack for our fans while we cook the five-course meal that's Fallout 5, I honestly feel it would have been a hit. It would have been like a sleeper hit, you know? Sort of like they did with Fallout Shelter. But instead, they tried to tease it out as another standalone installment in the series. That was a big mistake and actually had the opposite effect of trying to generate greater buzz. It generated negative buzz. The reason is simple. People don't like being lied to. Authenticity always wins the day. Not all hope is lost for gamers, though. If you like Fallout mainly because of its post-apocalyptic world, and not so much because it's specifically a bug Bethesda game, then I mentioned in my Afterthoughts video that Metro Exodus is coming out February 15th. Well, since then, I learned that my new favorite game studio, Ubisoft, is coming out with Far Cry New Dawn on the very same day. This is what I'm talking about. I hadn't even heard of that until like a week or two ago, and it's coming out in like two months. And it's actually the sequel to Far Cry 5 that takes place a couple decades after the nukes drop. That is so unbelievably cool. And I saw some beta footage and it plays perfectly. The shooting is on point and it looks visually phenomenal. Of course, it's an Ubisoft game. So you only have to wait two months and you'll get two amazing alternatives to Fallout 76 if, you know, if you're in it for the post-apocalyptic experience. And yet another reason why I think Fallout 76 may be cooked. Anyway, I really appreciate if you made it this far. I know this was a longer video, but I wanted to get this off my chest, both so you guys know where my heart is, and so perhaps the climate continues to improve in the gamer sphere. In a weird way, I think this backlash was actually good for Bethesda in the long run. I think they've been humbled into understanding that you can no longer stand on brand name alone. You actually have to demonstrate honesty and authenticity, and you have to deliver an ever-improving quality product. It's that simple. I'd really like game companies to take us back to a time when they cared about their fans over the bottom line you know what i'm saying take me home bethesda take me home, take me home.